Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise and welcome your moderator, host of the AOL.com show, What to Watch, and today's guest, the cast of Crimson Peak. Thanks, everybody. Um, this movie is so, so cool, you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my first question is, it's so cinematic. It's so beautifully filmed. The art direction is unbelievable. How much did you know of what it was going to look like when you were approached about doing this project, and how much of that was uh, a selling point for you? I think for me, Guillermo del Toro was the selling point. I'd worked with him on Mama, a film that he produced. Love the Devil's Backbone and Pad's Labyrinth and his huge imagination. So when he sent me the script, I and also understanding his passion for the Gothic romance, uh, I I knew that whatever I could imagine, just to up it because uh, he was the man to tell the story. What did the how how was the the house does uh, how was the house described in the script? Could you sort of see it from the page? Could you get an idea from it? I, I did, the house has become so indelibly printed on my mind as a, as, some, as a set that I actually can't remember how it was, how it was um, described in the script. I mean, it was, I found the script incredibly atmospheric. Um, it, was, it was emotionally sophisticated and psychologically engaging, but it was also cr incredibly spooky. And um, the combination of the two is something I had ne I'd never read before. Um, and it was the sophistication of the engagement of the three characters that we play that I, that I really wanted to jump into. And then the house, I mean, the house really was, I, we've said it a lot recently, but the house was the most extraordinary um, manifestation of Guillermo's imagination. It was, um, it was built on a, on a soundstage in Toronto, and the first time I saw it, it was like stepping into another world. It was like going through a kind of Narnia-style cupboard into a very dark, creepy place. The house is amazing. It's one of those things that you see in a movie and you think, oh, when they're doing press, this is going to be the thing that they're going to talk about. But you have to talk about it. I can't imagine you would ever get tired of talking about it. It's so beautiful and cool. Mia, can you talk about working on that set? I mean, there's a working elevator in what looks like a dilapidated, destroyed house. Yeah, I think it's getting increasingly rare to be on a set that has an actual, that's been you know built for you, I guess, because visual effects are so kind of affordable and common now. Um, so it's always sort of such a treat when it's a very traditional set that's built and felt like we were constantly seeing new details in it and, you know, that they would flick a switch and the walls in the kitchen would start, like, seeping with that clay and, um, and that, you know, the word fear was um, kind of in the wallpaper, in the shape of moths. and um, So, yeah, just beautiful details that we were always discovering, I think. Can I ask a silly question? Can you talk about your hair in, in the movie? You have amazing hair throughout the film, especially when you're sort of storming the halls or, or scared, walking yeah. through the halls scared of this house. Yeah, it's a bit of a hair fetish film, I think. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we had two different wigs, I think Jessica and I. One was like an out wig and the other was an up wig because there was no way that out wig was ever going to get up on our head. So, um, we, yeah, they were really heavy, but very beautiful. And, um, you know, I was kind of trapped by it, though, because you'd kind of try and sneak off to the bathroom and they'd, you'd have, like, three people running after you. And they'd be like, I'm not going to peel my hair. I, I know what I'm doing. I, I'm it was long like enough, 25. Though, <laughs> it's long enough, though, that that could be a, a problem. I'd totally, be worried. But, you know, I'm... We're all grown-ups, and we deal with that with clothes every day, so, um, yeah. Jessica, uh, not just the wig, but talk about uh, your character. I don't think anybody has seen you portray a anyone like this before. Yeah, this is, uh, that's why I wanted to play Lucille. I'd never done anything like this, and the reason I'm an actor is I want to understand human nature and understand people that are different from me. Uh, so yes, I, I also had a very, very difficult long wig that went all the way down to my feet <laughs> um, many times. And um, in my trailer on loop were 
I, of course, I had books that inspired me for Lucille, but I also had three movies that were a huge inspiration for me when thinking of the character. And it was Rebecca, Misery, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Wow. <laughs> Eat your lunch, that, Blanche. <laughs> that actually, now that you say that, makes perfect sense to me, those yeah. three movies. And w incredible actresses um, that you know, understood the genre that they were in, and it's just, they're fun and scary and creepy, and, and I wanted to jump into that. Well, you have, a, you have a sort of gothic horror story there, right? You mm -hmm. have the, the sort of the games of whatever happened to Baby Jane, you know? That yeah, the dynamic between the women and being kind of trapped in a house, and then also misery with that whole hobbling scene, you know, keeping him in the bed, and how for Kathy Bates' character in Misery, it was a very almost erotic. Psychotic monster. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love all those performances by those ladies are incredible. And Tom, I brought up a, a, a scene when I was talking in the green room, I brought up a scene with you that I just thought was so elegantly filmed, which is the waltz scene. <laughs> and you very quickly got very excited and said, can I please talk about the history of the waltz? <laughs> so I don't really, I didn't really know how to phrase that question about okay. the history of the waltz for okay. you. So I'm going to just let you take that okay. away. Well, they're, they're, I mean, true to, uh, True to Gothic romance, it is a, it is a love story. It's a love story with ghosts in it, and um, and the supernatural and the horrific elements come from the romance. You know, a young woman falls for a a, a dark stranger from another land, and and um, the romance happens quite early in the film. And Guillermo was going for I don't know if anyone's seen uh, Visconti's The Leopard, uh, which is an amazing film, um, an Italian film <clears throat> based on the Italian novel about kind of the Sicilian, Sicilian royalty in the late 19th century. And there's extraordinary party in that film. Um, and he was sort of, that was his nod to, to that, his cinema hero in a way. And Mia's character and, we, and I, we basically fall in love through this waltz. And it's shot very beautifully and it's by candlelight. And um, shot by, I mean, it's by a candlelight or would you guys didn't shoot it? Only with candlelight, I would imagine. Uh, no, we shot it with light, but, okay, that, but, but, it's, but it has this extraordinarily um, golden quality to it. Um, it's beautiful. And the camera, the camera dances with us in a way. And what I found amazing is in my research of the waltz, at this time, it's set in 1901, and uh, if you went to a party and you were expected to dance in society, you were, normally would dance in figures of eight or 16 with your partner on your left or your right. And it was only in Vienna um, with those crazy Viennese, you know, who were, who were rebelling against the system, they suddenly invented this waltz, uh, the waltz where you danced with your partner face to face, chest to chest. You could, you know, smell each other's breast, uh, breath. Sorry. Oh! Oh, a whole bunch of people just got very happy in the audience. Hold the phone. <laughs> um... <laughs> I, 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 think, gotta, I, just I think the waltz is. I think the waltz is very sexy. I'll leave it there. It's um, impossible for me not to just say, "What do breasts smell like, Tom?" I'm sorry, <laughs> Tom. I couldn't Bereta. leave that open. I apologize. Um, <laughs> oh dear, it's all gone. It's all gone south. Um, but no, I think that the. the I <laughs> sorry, Mia. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Stay away from me. Uh, <laughs> Um, anyway, my point is that it's, a, it's actually was it's a very it's a beautiful the form of the waltz is very beautiful and um, and there's something very um, there's something very thrilling about the about spinning around in circles and and um, the intimacy of it I think is really is I love that and I think Guillermo shot it very beautifully and I was I, I loved hearing that you thought that was a you know, a great sequence in the film. Yeah, there's a great sequence. I, I think, uh, as I said, the, there was a shot in that film where I was immediately reminded that I was watching a filmmaker of Guillermo's caliber, which is a sort of, not to say that he's announcing himself, but there's a shot that reminds you, oh, there's a man behind the camera here who has designed all of this, you yeah. know? Uh, I don't want to give it away. Not that that's a spoiler. <laughs> um, but on that note, Guillermo being a filmmaker of that calendar, caliber and one who is... Uh, referential, not in a in a stealing way, but in an homage way. Uh, you mentioned a few movies that you watched for. I'm curious if he showed you guys some movies outside of The Leopard and showed you anything, Mia, for your character or what the film was going to look like. Um, I read some books that he sort of vaguely recommended. I read Frankenstein and The Turn of the Screw, um, and they were both brilliant. And I 
I didn't have a huge knowledge of the um, genre of gothic romance or even of like horror in literature. So that was really great for me. And I know Tom read some books as well. Yeah, he, he um, it was an, he's sort of his inspiration. Uh, he really wanted to, to, to kind of tip his hat to gothic romance and, and there were some, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Um, and obviously things were very clear to me like Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights and um, the fall of the House of Usher. Um, and so all of that is in the mix. Those are his sort of ingredients. Yeah. What is it like working with Guillermo instead? Someone who's so focused on the visual elements of the film but is also commanding really great performances. I mean, oftentimes you get movies where the visuals are beautiful but you don't get maybe the best performance from the actors because someone was focused on one other thing. You're getting a lot from him in this movie and a lot from you guys. How does he sort of manage both with you? For me, it's wonderful because he's very collaborative. So uh, he lets you, you, you feel free to try anything and... Um, I had signed on to this movie o over a year before we made it, and even these ideas that I had about the character, he and I, sometimes we get on the phone and talk about it, and then he'd call me up and say, oh, I wrote this great scene. And there's a scene that um, my character is taking care of, um, Edith. And she's Would we really... say taking care? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very special care. <laughs> um, like taking care, like, yeah. Yes. Where well, she's feeding her in... Uh, in the bedroom, and um, Guillermo had written that uh, and called me about it. And so it was a constant back and forth where I felt like he was so inspiring to me, just made, put, you know, made me want to go even further than I thought was possible with the character. And I, I felt he kind of did that with everyone. He let us all really try what we wanted. What does that mean, try what you wanted? What did that mean for you? Do you have an example of a moment where it felt like you were really in command of what you were doing? While but, he was directing you? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. There's a scene towards the end, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a scene of um, uh, where some, you know, Thomas and Edith tell each other the truth. And um, it's a truth that hasn't been expressed um, up until that point. And it's a very, very high stakes moment. And there's a lot of adrenaline and, and, uh, in both of the characters at that point. And as written, it was quite speechy and he can he can he confessed that he said to him about three days ahead he was saying what do you think of this scene i think it's it's a little too formal i think the nature of the scene is it's much more instinctive and 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 all of the, everything you say comes right from your heart um and so i think it should have a more spontaneous quality and and mia and i uh, and guillermo in that moment um completely rewrote the scene and um if you want to know what the scene is, when you see it, it takes place um, at the top of the elevator stairs when uh, Edith finds Thomas. She's called the elevator and Thomas arrives in the elevator and they have a conversation. That, and, it's, and it's very immediate, it's very uh, emotional and it's very direct. And, and, um, and I love that scene as a result. It was a, 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 that immediate reworking of the script. That's got to be so important for you uh, as an actor when you're making a project because so often as a, when someone writes, they're writing as a writer and they're writing to make sure that it's clear to the yeah. reader. But when, when you, then when you start performing or you get into production, you realize that you're overly clear or you were too clear on the page and it's harder to perform. Yeah, I mean, that's what's funny about... Um, well, that's the incredible thing about cinema in the end is the, the truthfulness of the camera. The camera is... is um, it captures everything, and, and, and so the discipline for us is, is, to, is, to be, is to be truthful, always. It has to feel real. Even if the situation is heightened, it has to feel like it's emotionally real. Um, and sometimes when you're bringing dialogue off the page um, in the environment, it's the three of us on the set, it doesn't feel like it's... The architecture of the writing is too formal, and you have to shake it up to make it real. And, and to me, that's the, that's the thrill of, of working on a set. Absolutely. Mia, if you, if you want to address that, I mean, you anchor the film. You're scene one to shot one to last shot of the movie. It's an incredible performance. You, uh, like I said, you, you anchor the film. You're, you're our hero. What was that like? Did that feel like a major challenge for you? Uh, yeah, it was great. I think um, the danger when you're playing a character that's the audience's eyes into the world is that, um, that that central character kind of becomes less important and um, it's more what's happening around them. But I always felt like Guillermo was so great at um, making sure that Edith didn't ever become too passive or too naive and, and just 
um, always being super supportive if anything didn't feel quite right and, and allowing all of us to sort of imbue it with our own ideas as well. So, yeah. Well, she's definitely not too passive. I mean, the, she's sort of on the same wavelength as the audience the whole time. We're all kind of picking it up at the, at the same time as Edith. And uh, yeah. it's equally as terrifying, I think, for the audience as it maybe is for, for the character. Were you, you said you weren't, you, you weren't really that knowledgeable of the gothic horror genre before. Did you become fascinated with it afterwards? Did you become interested in it afterwards or while shooting? Yeah, I definitely gained a, um, a real appreciation for it because I didn't, I knew it on a very basic level, but it was, um, to me, like horror means like a slasher film or something. So I've always been kind of wary of the genre, but um, Guillermo, I mean, I think it's much more sophisticated than that and, and definitely psych, it can be a psychological horror and those are more powerful, I think, than just sort of blood and gore. And, and Guillermo definitely is more focused on that. Well, I think for those who like blood and gore, I would say that the film definitely plays with tone. Just a little bit. And, yeah, and you get, you get a lot of the highbrow with a lot of the visceral at the same time. Um, so I can enjoy myself with the highbrow and then at some point be like, sick. <laughs> nice. Um, was that something that was a lot of fun for you guys as well? Like, I mean, you get to do so many different things as an actor. You get to have these incredibly emotional scenes that are about love, that are about family, and then you also get to have these crazy, cool, bloody battles. Yeah, uh, you know, it's for me, it was more fun watching it than actually doing it, because the last 20 minutes of the movie, it, was, is, it takes a lot of energy to sustain that. And um, to, for the movie itself or for you as the actor you when you were the shooting actor, it? Because something that could happen in 20 minutes on film is days and weeks of us shooting. And um, yeah, do you mind me asking? I mean, I know a lot yeah. of people haven't seen it, but how long did it take to shoot that, that climactic scene? Well, there's many scenes put together, so they were actually spread out a bit. But we tried to shoot everything in the weeks. house. Was it, it was three weeks total? Three weeks. So the, la the last half an hour took about three yeah. or four weeks. <laughs> but. I loved, I mean, the, the movies of my youth are like uh, Interview with the Vampire and Gary Oldman's Dracula. I love those movies because they're sexy and, you know, theatrical and a little bit scary. And, and of course, I love Rebecca and um, The Innocents and all, uh, and all of that. So for me, watching it, 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 was, it was wonderful. What was your uh, favorite scene to shoot, Tom? Probably it was the waltz, I have to say. Like, I th because, because we got to the waltz after we'd done the end of the film, which, which was very, very intense. Um, every character is in a life or death situation. I mean, r immediately life or death, seconds away from, from one or the other. And so the experience of doing that as an actor is you, is you have to put your mind and body in that environment and recreate the uh, effect on, you know, it, it, if you're terrified and desperate, it affects the way you breathe. And we were doing that for hours and hours and hours, day after day. And we finally finished it and we moved outside and the snow in Toronto melted and, and we started literally dancing. And the experience of, 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 of working for a day was just so much more uh, uplifting, wasn't it? <laughs> so, but I also, I loved my, the bits with that. Thomas is an engineer. He's an inventor. And... Um, He's actually more gifted as an industrialist than anybody in the film gives him credit for. He's actually capable. And he invents this machine, which eventually works, and they built it. The machine is all real. It's so cool yeah. when, when we finally see that machine, because we see the, rep, the, the, mi the mini replica That's or right. whatever, and then when we actually see the machine, it's like, it's like the house. You suddenly think, holy shit, you guys built this for this movie? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. It was an extraordinary thing to be on. I mean, I don't know how they got it up to the top of that hill, but, but it worked, you know. Um, the, 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 the mechanics of it were, were completely real. Um, it felt like kind of driving a train. It was extraordinary, yeah. Mia, what would you say your uh, favorite scene to shoot was in the movie? No spoilers. Um, I think um, because for a lot of the film, my character's sick and scared, and um, I was pretty excited to do the last stuff. Um, and Guillermo was really sweet. Like, he'd come up to me and be like, uh, I know this is hard, but, you know, I promise next week you get to stab somebody. And uh, I'd be like, thank you. Um, so, yeah. That's what I, would get you through a week. You're like, next week I'm going to stab somebody. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. It was fun. Just, yeah. I think we have some time for uh, audience questions. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? 
I bet you do. Hi, Tom. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first time I saw you on the big screen is War Horse, then Avengers, then I'm going to see this movie tonight. So from drama to uh, superhero to horror movies, it seems to me that you can handle all kinds of characters in all types of films. So it makes me curious that um, if you can choose any female character to play in any movie, who would that be? <laughs> any, well, any female character from any movie? Gosh. Tootsie. Uh, what's that? Tootsie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, oh, no. Um, that's a really maybe, tough question. Maybe Chris Hemsworth and I could do Thelma and Louise. <laughs> yes. I like that. That's good. I don't know. Although, I, yeah, I, I think probably the balance needs redressing in the other direction, but it's a fun question. Thank you. <laughs> Next question from the audience. Sure. Uh, Tom and Mia. Um, I loved both of your performances in Only, Only Lovers Left Alive, and I was wondering what it was like to be reunited for this film and if it was different in any, any way. It was great. It was really, it's so nice to work with someone when you've had a great time the first time and you get to you know, do something different. Um, and I, I, there's this sort of trust that you have. The tr acting is all about trust in the end. And um, the fact that we'd already done, the, you know, we, we had been together in Only Lovers Left Alive um, in a slightly different relationship. Yeah. Um, but it was really, really nice to work together again. Yeah, I loved it. It's always good when you when you know the person, and it just sort of eliminates that, um, you know, kind of getting to know you thing, and you can just already be very um, e at ease. So yeah, it was really great. And that's a Jim Jarmusch film. This is a Guillermo del Toro film. I feel like the three of you together have probably worked with all of the best directors that there is out there. How do you think that that happened? What do you think you owe to that? Not necessarily that success, but sort of being chosen by these people and working with them. Can you answer that question? <laughs> I am a movie fan first and foremost, an audience member, and so I kind of, you know, I make it known certain directors that I want to work with, so perhaps that's also why I'm, we've been very lucky. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I was like, if you don't want to, I'll go on to the audience, yeah. that's okay. Um, what was the question again, sorry? Uh, I mean, you've had such, I don't want to use the word luck because you're incredibly talented, but the directors who have, who, who have chosen you guys to be in their films have all been incredible filmmakers, some yeah. of the best that we actually have out there. I mean, David Cronenberg, Jim Jarmusch, Guillermo del Toro, it's yeah. incredible. What do you owe, do you, do you think, to, uh, to being a part of their, to being in their work? No one else was available, I think. So. <laughs> Good answer. That was awesome. So, yeah. We'll stick with that. <laughs> uh, next question from the audience. Hi. Hi. I'm a big fan of all of you, first of all. Even you, your interviewing style is awesome. Um, cool. I wanted to know, <laughs> for each of you, what's the best piece of advice for an aspiring actor? My, I would say that um, you have to do something every day to remind yourself that you're an actor. I, you know, I, you may be doing something else to make money, waiting tables or whatever. But every single day, do something that is for you and your craft. Whether it be taking a movement class or... I remember when I was in Santa Monica, I would go to the library every day and I was adapting Hamlet, a female version of Hamlet for the cinema. Um, whatever you do, do something every single day. Don't wait for someone to give you a job to then tell you who you are. I guess I would, I would extend that by just saying, trust your gut and follow your heart. Because I think as you, as you sort of set out on the path of being an actor, a lot of people will try and tell you how to be and who to be. Uh, and um, I think that's very dangerous. Like you can get lost, you know? It's so important to own uh, your own view of the world. And, um, and there's something very courageous in that. Uh, so it's, it sounds like a simple piece of advice, but it's actually hard. It's the hardest thing to do, to trust your gut. Run and never look back. <laughs> but probably just trust your instinct and, and, you know, think about if you want to do it for, like, the right reasons. And, and then, yeah, I guess just keep trying. Absolutely. Next question. 
Hey, so uh, at the end of Avengers, all the Avengers go and eat a bunch of shawarma, but Loki doesn't get to. So I wanted to know, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? And also, Loki's like in a mask. Is that so he can't eat the shawarma? <laughs> Shawarma's like a kebab. Jessica Chastain doesn't know what shawarma is. It's like, it's like a kebab, I think. It's like halal, like yeah. a halal sandwich. Um, <laughs> you know, I th honestly... Answer that with another word. You <laughs> I'm a vegan. Uh, <laughs> um, I, think, I think Loki is cool. I think, he's, I think he doesn't, he's cool without the shawarma, if I'm honest. Um, and he's not really part of the team. It was kind of a team thing. So, um, you know, he, he tried to take over the world that wasn't really involved in being part of that team. Um, and he wasn't invited. Um, he's good, man. He's Loki. He doesn't need shawarma. Next question. Hey, um, I'd like to talk about just the intricacies of the genre that you were working in. Can you think of any specific creative challenges or adjustments to your process that you had to make that were genre specific? I think it's really important to. Um, uh, it's interesting because we've all done a, a you know a different a wide variety of different things, and I think the resp our responsibility is to take some time to sync up with the vision of the director, um, because you want as an actor to be free with your instinct, but you also need an infrastructure and a context to place yourself in, which is in line with the tone of what the director is trying to do. And so I think Guillermo was very helpful in 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 his recommendations of novels, of films, of paintings, of you know, allowing us into the framework of his imagination, saying, this is the world I'm building, and, and these are the archetypes, um, so that it gives your instinct a guide, and then once you step on set, you can be completely free. Um, so in, I think, for me, it's about creating a, an imaginative context within which I can then place myself. Uh, oh, go ahead, Jessica, I'm sorry. It's okay. I was going to say also, you ha for me, it was ha trying to understand and to fit the scale of what he was doing. Like when me, it was talking about the hair fetish <laughs> or whatever it was. I mean, to wear these wigs and to wear these costumes, you have to fit into it. So it just looks like, you know, normally I'd be wearing a, a pair of sweatpants and it's fine. It's just who I am. And so the characters have to match the scale of the world that they're living in. And I found that otherwise I'm just, it's a hair show and, and a bunch of velvet. Um, so that too was something that I had to figure out with Guillermo. Uh, the film is not your typical Halloween horror movie at all, but it is coming out for Halloween and we're talking about costumes. So I'm curious what you guys are going to go as for Halloween, <laughs> considering the topic of the movie and what kind of movie it is. Well, I'm on set in Prague for Halloween. I don't, I don't think that they really celebrate it, but I have on the way to set, driven by a place that says Sexy Costumes, spelled with a K. I might go in there for Halloween, see what I can find, and uh, wear it to the set. But other than that, I'm sadly not going to celebrate. Uh, I'm going to be wearing my, my costume for Kong Skull Island, because that's what I'll be doing. There you go. I don't know what I'm going to do at the moment. We don't do it as well in Australia as they do here, but um, maybe I'll go as Tom or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think we have time for so one. so flattered if you did that. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. I love Jessica in uh, your Broadway debut in The Heiress, and I'm wondering when Tom is going to make his Broadway debut. <laughs> I'd love to see you in Henry V or Prince Hal. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, I've actually those two those two characters you mentioned. I've already played. Um, I I, did, I played Prince Hal and Henry V on um, in a film for television um, called The Hollow Crown. So uh, I guess if you're burning to see me in those parts, I would <laughs> direct you to that. Um, but you know, gently. You don't don't rush. You know, take your time. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I would love to do theatre in this city. I, I mean, I, um, it's something I've, I actually have done it once. I, I, I played at, uh, the, at BAM, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in 2007 with a production of Cymbeline. Um, but I'd love to come back. Uh, I don't know when or how um, or with what. I have to just make the time and make the commitment. But um, thank you very much for saying that you'd like to see it.
Well, guys, I think that's all the time that we have. Congratulations on a great film and magnificent performances in it. Thank you so much for being here. And the film comes out today. 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 Go see Crimson Peak, guys. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>